is uh, Rob Nido. And Rob was born in Rochester, New York. He received a uh, BA from Brown University, an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. Um, among the awards and grants he's received, the, uh, Rob received an artist res residency at Yada in Saratoga Springs, New York. He's received a Joan Mitchell Foundation Career Grant and a Joan Mitchell Foundation MFA Grant. Uh, also an award of excellence from RISD in 1999 and a fellowship grant RISD in 1998. Um, Visiting artists and lecture programs include uh, Rhode Island School of Design in 2008 and Marlboro College in 2007. Um, Rob also is very interested in curation. Um, his curatorial projects include Accident Black Spot at Marcus Winter Gallery in Berlin, Germany, and Glimpse, a group show, a group exhibit at Mixed Screens in New York City in 2005. Uh, and Rob is, will be featured in New American Painting Northwest Edition in 2008-2009. Um, Rob currently lives uh, and maintains a studio in the Dumbo area of Brooklyn in New York. He's represented by Mixed Greens Gallery in Chelsea, in the Chelsea Arts District of New York City. And Rob, we're very happy to have you here. Hey, how you doing? I'm um, Rob. Uh, yeah, first just uh, thanks Ruth for that introduction. Um, and uh, thanks to Jared for that uh, great talk. And uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to be uh, showing with him here. And uh, thanks to uh, John and Diane Merrick for their uh, very generous support with this program. Um, it's been great uh, being here for the last couple days and uh, just really enjoying it. Um, uh, it's blank up here. Oh, just at the space bar? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try and figure out this computer. Uh, uh, I'm going to play with the volume for a little bit. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm going to play some music while I'm talking. It's going to be very low level, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's how I work. I, I kind of list, always listen to music. It's always happening. Uh, I grew up listening to music. My dad always had it on stereo, and, uh, and I play music. So it's, uh, it's a big part of my practice and, uh, and my life. So I'm going to turn it down a little bit. And can you barely hear it? Can you hear it? About, yeah? All right, cool. Talk last. I'll talk last. Not, not gonna, definitely. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, this is um, this is the bedroom I grew up in. <laughs> uh, I was up in Rochester looking at some old photographs over Christmas, and uh, I found this one. And, I, and this was my bedroom until I was about seven years old, six or seven years old. And uh, so, so you know, basically, I show this because. Um, if you don't like what you have to see today, you can blame it on my parents. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it was it was really uh, it was great to find that picture because uh, you know I remember it very vividly as a kid, and uh, I remember having nightmares as a kid. And I also remember like at a really early age uh, drawing on on everything, you know, on any wall in the house, any surface I could find, I drew on it, and uh, you know that's just sort of stuck with me. Um, this is, a, this is a painting from 1998, uh, when I was in graduate school at RISC. Um, and uh, you know, I went into grad school painting uh, really thick, kind of messy oil paintings. And uh, very quickly put that aside, and, 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 uh, and I hated acrylic. I had a real aversion to acrylic for, for whatever reason, because it wasn't I don't know, I thought you had to be an oil painter to be a true artist, you know. And, uh, and, and, and I sort of got to questioning that, and, it, and I decided, well, because I dislike it so much, maybe I ought to try and use it. So I started painting in just acrylic. And, um, and these painting, this painting was made by, um, you know, just pouring uh, acrylic polymer and pigment onto sheets of plastic and letting it dry and, 
peeling it up and then and sticking it on, on the canvas. So it's sort of like, they're almost like kitchen magnets or uh, uh, color forms, if you've ever heard of them. This is also from 1999. Uh, same idea, like all the lines in this painting were made by pouring strings of, of acrylic paint and then peeling it up and, and literally, it's like applique almost. Uh, this one has a little combination of like painting directly on the canvas and, uh, and the applique process. It's called follicles falling. These are color forms in case, probably most of you don't know what they are, but when I was a kid, this was like video games. <laughs> they were, like, they were die, die cut pieces of vinyl and you could uh, like peel them up and you get these kits and you could take, take these little pieces and build little uh, you know, scenes. Like you could build your own picture. Uh, this is uh, a couple years later from 2002, uh, my first solo show in New York um, at LFL Gallery. Uh, same process. It's about 72 inches tall and 84 inches wide. Uh, at this point I started using some spray gun like that back space was created by some, using like a big automobile spray gun. And then I made all these pieces off the canvas and, and stuck them on. Uh, this is a photograph I took in my sister's apartment in San Diego. Uh, I'm going to show like photographs found photographs, you know, all sorts of stuff along with the paintings, because uh, it's, it's just informative to, you know, how I see the world and, and kind of where my inspiration comes from. Uh, it comes from everywhere, really. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of like, it's, it's like a big assimilation process. Uh, this is another painting from 2002 called The Cloud Sculptors. Um, again, using that same process. You know, there's sort of, I think I put that photograph there just because there was this sense of light and space in these two objects and it kind of reminded me of this. Uh, this is an artist, Jeff Hellrod. Uh, he's around 40. He paints some shows in New York. And around this time, like, like in grad school, uh, and you know, early 2001, 2002, uh, I was really uh, getting influenced by you know the computer and making images digitally and and sort of using processes that kind of mimicked digital processes. Um, you know, uh, Jeff Elrod creates these drawings on the computer. This is mine. This isn't his. Creates drawings on the computer and then uh, and then just literally blows them up and, and paints them. Uh, you know, the, where I saw the connection with my work is that, uh, you know, these prefabricated parts uh, and this, la this layering process it was almost like working in Photoshop where, you know, I could take these things and stick them onto the canvas and move them around and it wasn't necessarily committed to an image. Uh, it was like having layers that you could click on and off and sort of, you know, play around with. Uh, this is called Carruthers Plastic Parable. Carruthers was a scientist who worked for du uh, DuPont and he invented plastic. I don't know if we should thank him. Or... <laughs> this is from 2004. Uh, and at this point, I mean, I was starting to, to get a little frustrated with this kind of applique thing. and Because you know what the problem was? That it like, it, it offered too many possibilities. Like I could change my mind too much and I found that like I got paralyzed. Like I mean, I just I had too many options so I didn't really, I could never finish a painting. Uh, so I, I, I felt like I, decided to start, I needed to start painting again, like getting in there with a brush and actually committing myself to making marks on the canvas. Uh, you know, they're like taking chances. You know, I think that's like, that's a big part of the process of making art is, uh, you know, flirting with failure and sort of, because, because it's, it's by taking those chances, by failing, it's by figuring out what doesn't work that you get to somewhere new, that you get to a place where you can have a new perspective and uh, see something new. So I, I wanted to pull some of that back in and, and I started very gingerly here. Um, you know, everything is kind of spaced out uh, 
this is called the Square Pushers from 2004. This is uh, seven feet by nine feet. Uh, I was using acrylic and oil on canvas. I was using some applique and some was scraped on and some was poured on and some was spatula on. Uh, Kind of like, you know, just sort of like using like a, the kitchen sink approach, you know, just basically any any way of getting the paint on there I was going to try. This is called Petrochemical Love, also from 2005. I started using a spray gun. I can't remember what this is titled. Uh, <laughs> some more influences. Um, you know, sort of that digital space is always kind of very interesting to me. Uh, you know, when I was a really young kid, uh, Atari 2600 was like like the, like the vanguard of digital <laughs> uh, of all uh, evolution. And uh, this game is called Venture. Uh, and you know, so 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 that interests me. I mean, you know, so many things in the world interest me, but one in particular is vernacular architecture. Uh, you know, this giant orange uh, water cooler, uh, which you know, just these things that sort of kind of pop up in the landscape, and you just are like, oh my god, what, what is that? And in fact, I, we were driving up Signal Hill last night, and there's a there's a remarkable specimen there <laughs> that looks like a UFO that literally just landed at the house. And it's for sale. Uh, I think I think someone should buy it and make it an artist residence. This is untitled from uh, 2006. Um, this is duct tape on canvas, uh, 30 by 40 inches. Um, so, you know, this is sort of, again, kind of referencing that geometric space, but also <coughs> this like sort of monumentality of uh, those kinds of. The monumentality of that sort of vernacular architecture. Uh, that's Jerry Garcia, uh, and that you know what I don't know, you might be asking what Jerry Garcia and some more water towers in 2001 space odyssey had in common. Uh, I can't really answer that for you, except that it, <laughs> they're all things I'm interested in, um, and uh, you know. You know, music again is a big influence, and um, and uh, I guess I, I put the Grateful Dead there because that's something I grew up listening to, um, but also because it's like it takes this history of American music um, and you know updates it, but also like the greatest thing I think they did in terms of like rock and roll is to bring in this whole sort of improvisational aspect to it. Um, so he was drawing, they were drawing on blues and jazz and like Americana and creating rock and roll. But at the same time, it was improvisational so that it could go anywhere um, and, and they could do anything. And, uh, you know, that's sort of like, again, like this thing about taking chances and approaching art in a way that is open ended as opposed to closed down and sort of narrow. Um, you know, for me, it is. Um, I don't know, that's really, that's, that's a lot about what it's about. That like I could start an idea of an image, I could have this idea of an image in my head and say this is what I have to paint. But through the process of attempting to paint that and figuring new things out, it, you know, it's open to going anywhere and it can become anything. Um, you know, and uh, so, I don't know, around 2005, 2006, um, I completely stopped using that applique thing and was painting directly on the canvas, uh, trying to, you know, I was sort of using this geometric line thing format to um, give myself a structure to work, uh, to work with it, like, you know, so that I would have a composition that could just focus on how to paint and not really worry so much about what I was painting. Um, this I just named Baltimore Civic Center, 1972. <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, it was a dead show, i got to be honest. Uh, this was a show in 2006 that makes screens um, of more of these types of paintings, uh, sort of using this one-point perspective and, uh, 
And um, you know, just really focusing on, on how I'm putting the paint on to the canvas and sort of playing with like breaking up a single point perspective. Um, this is in Berlin at the airport at Tegel, uh, you know, which obviously references those paintings. Uh, this was, it's just this really amazing tunnel that connects you between two parts of the terminal. And it's like this, uh, like this environment scape. And you walk down it, and the lights on the side are constantly changing. And there will be like, you know, little sounds of like frogs and like crickets like you're in a rainforest. And, but you've got all these Germans, you know. <laughs> it's really bizarre. It's really, really bizarre. Really psychedelic. That's just sort of a head-on picture. These are these are photos I, I've taken too. Um, uh, this is called Charlie Don't Surf. This is untitled uh, diptych. You know, it's sort of wanting to, to to break again, break that perspective, and just sort of screw with the image a bit. Again, all 2005, 2006. I don't know what kind of tree that is. And then, and then I was, okay, so, and this became sort of a pivotal point. 2005, 2006, making these single point perspective paintings, uh, I literally was painting myself into a corner, into like, you know, there was sort of nowhere to go. It's kind of like, well, what, you know, what can I do? It's sort of like, and it's, it was antithetical to what I sort of believe, this thing I'm talking about, like, you know, opening up space. I'm suddenly finding myself closing things in and becoming very constricted and what, you know, what possibilities can come out of this. So I just, you know, started throwing stuff on top of the painting, trying to sort of disrupt, you know, that, that idea. Um, and this is called the turnaround. It's the last painting I made with that sort of perspectival thing. Um, and uh, it's interesting that Jared was talking about facets and stuff. I mean, just looking at like uh, you know Buckminster Fuller um, again, sort of vernacular architecture um, built out of these faceted things. Uh, and then you know, there's also like you know, other things that influence me. It's just sort of like the consumerist uh, society that we live in, and the, the emphasis on products and consumption and the waste that comes out of that. Um, and, uh, you know, that combined with sort of like my love for nature and just the outdoors. Um, this is a mountain made entirely of rocks in Arizona, the Anza Borrego Desert. And that's just a man-made mountain with bricks. But that monumentality and some of that architecture I was kind of thinking about and was trying to you know, break out of a single point perspective, but still sort of using these like locked in forms to build something. That's called Mound 2006. This is called Seep from 2006 and Shift on the right, 2006. Uh, again, this is seven by nine, no, seven by eight feet. Uh, it's just this big pile of lines. Detail. And in this show, in 2006, I also, so concurrently with like making these paintings of all the stripes and perspective, uh, I had gotten, you know, like I said, I was getting frustrated and, and I needed, I wanted to, like, I wanted to find out what was sort of underneath all these impulses and like what you know what was sort of at my core as an artist and, and, and I wanted to try and get to that without uh, you know any sort of mediation without with as little sort of influence or, or anything else um, as possible and you know so so the thing I, I came up with was just like I needed a real simple plan I needed something really simple uh, so I just decided on a piece of paper size seven inches by five inches um, mainly because it was convenient because that's the how the pad was made, and uh, and I like the texture of the paper, and I just sort of said to myself, you know, I'm going to stop painting um, for a while, or the wall I'm painting. I'm just going to every day I'm going to come into the studio, and the first thing I'm going to do is take one of these pieces of paper, take a brush, one brush, and take one or two colors, and just sit down and just make something quickly, 
fast, without thinking about it, without fussing about it, without worrying about what it's going to be or how it's going to look or what's going to happen with it. You know, just nothing. I just didn't want to worry about anything. And so I did this for a number of months, and um, eventually I literally had piles of these drawings. So um, in this show, I decided to um, install them, and this was the first time that I'd shown them. I think here there's like 150 of them, maybe. Uh, it's about 16 feet long and five or six feet tall. And uh, it's, you know, essentially a collection of my thoughts, really. Um, you know, no, no sort of linearity, really, other, you know, nothing really holds them together except for the fact that I made them and that I made them on this particular size piece of paper. And uh, it's the same. <laughs> This is Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. He was a uh, German philosopher and mathematician. Uh, he was a mathematician, uh, but no one remembers him as a mathematician. Actually, no one really remembers him at all, except that he, uh, Nietzsche, I think, rediscovered him in the late 19th century, he discovered uh, his notebooks, like these journals that he kept, and they were called the Pseudobucher in German, which um, in English translates to the waste books. And uh, essentially, these were just notebooks that he kept on a daily basis of like witticisms and aphorisms and thoughts and all these things. And uh, I had been reading him and, and sort of installing these drawings and making these drawings, and I just thought there was a, a really interesting connection there. Um, you know, that nothing about his writings tied each other together except that they were from his mind, his experience, his worldview. This is a black and white uh, installation. These are all black and white drawings. Uh, 200 in this installation that I did in Berlin in 2007. <coughs> They're all seven by five inches. They're all untitled. They're all wash or watercolor on paper. I'm just going to go through. I mean, usually when people come to the studio and I show them, uh, they're just going to pile. And you can, they're not very precious. I don't want them to be precious. I want them to be very um, accessible. So you can, you know, I just sort of give people a pile and they just go through them. But the thing I was sort of realizing with all this is that, like, it got back to my, uh, you know, my first love, the first painting book I ever got. I think I was in high school, my grandparents gave it to me. It was an uh, uh, exhibition from the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo. It was called Abstract Expressionism. Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, Franz Klein, uh, early Philip Guston, all these guys. Uh, they were my heroes. They were like, they were, like my, my heroes. And as I was making these drawings, I was noticing that like, really, you know, I'm not about this sort of rigidity of form. Or, or composition, or painting, or these lines, or perspective, or any of that. Um, you know, really, like my sort of first love that kind of got beaten out of me in school and grad school and all this other stuff uh, was sort of kind of gestural painting, you know, in, in the flesh, abstract gestural painting that was messy and loose and broken and, and corrupted and all that stuff. So um, I kind of went back to these guys. Um, this is a time life picture of all those artists from like 1950, somewhere around there. Uh, the disturbing thing about it is that it's all men and like one woman. Uh, the nice thing, and this is Joan Mitchell, who is a woman from that time and one of my favorite painters. Uh, Philip Guston, which some of you probably know. Most of you probably know. <coughs> You know, the nice thing is that, like, and this is Charlene von Heil. She's a, she's a woman painter living in New York, working today. Um, it's like, if you took that same picture today, uh, like, it would be, like, set in, in New York of abstract painters who are important, who are doing work that is critically important. Uh, it would be, like, 60, 70 percent women. This is Amy Stillman. Another uh, painter working, living today in, in uh, 
New York. And, and you know, both of these people are big influences on me. This is Albert Erlen, a German painter who I, uh, who uh, lives and works today, who, who is an influence. So, you know, this is shift, that meaning that you saw next to the big stripe meaning. Um, and this was kind of like me just sort of like saying, screw it, I'm just going to paint the way I want to paint again, you know? You know but, but, you know, in saying that, it's not like uh, I'm dismissing everything I've done or dismissing other modes of painting or anything. It's just that uh, I really believe that, you know, painting is a process of getting, making art. I mean, art and life are really not so, there's not much space between them. They're kind of the same thing. And uh, for me, the process of painting and being an artist is really a process of getting to know myself, you know, and, you know, believing in, in the things that I believe in and, and having faith that those are, are things that, that are worth doing uh, and that, that they need to be made to be put out in the world. Uh, so this is from summer of 2007. It's untitled. Uh, it's about... 84 inches tall, 60 inches wide. Uh, it's spray paint, acrylic, and acrylic on canvas. And um, I just, you know, I just started this painting and had no idea where it was going to end. I sort of had this vision in my head of this kind of dark hole, bruise thing. This was also from uh, summer of 2007. This is called Balances That Happen. And again, these things are coming directly out of those drawings and that process of sort of, you know, really freeing myself up and you know, allowing myself to just do what I do. This is called Heavy Chalk, which is in the show here uh, at the Press Gallery. This is Cy Twombly, another big influence. Um, I'm showing this right after Heavy Chalk because this, uh, the title for this, Heavy Chalk, um, kind of funny. It comes from, uh, it's an old gambling term. <laughs> when you used to go to the racetracks, the horse track, uh, they would post the odds of any given horse on a chalkboard. So it then used to be digital. You know, they would put it on a chalkboard. And if people, so every time the odds changed on a horse, they would erase it and write something else. And uh, if there was a lot of betting on a horse, if that horse was favored to, the, to win, those odds were constantly changing. So there was a lot of erasing, a lot of rewriting. So you know, if you were in the know and a horse was favored to win, you would say that horse had heavy chalk. And uh, I just thought it was a great, you know, I sort of like that it comes from a sphere outside of art. and. and this title that has multiple meanings, but it also, you know, relates to my process of painting, which is um, a lot of erasure, a lot of additive stuff, um, and it sort of had a loose reference, like in my mind, it had a loose reference to Cy Twombly, uh, especially his chalkboard paintings from like the late 60s, 70s. Uh, this is a window next to my studio. Dumbo, you can see the Brooklyn Bridge reflected in it, but I was more interested in the tape. Um, this is called Lo-Fi, 2007, uh, 84 inches tall, 72 inches wide. And so at this point, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just painting, you know, I'm just starting from an idea, a scrap of paper, a feeling in my head. You know, that woman, Charlene von Heil, whose paintings I showed, showed you, she talks about abstraction and painting in terms of uh, this image that sort of refuses to compromise and refuses to ever stay still, which I thought was kind of a beautiful way to talk about it. Um, and I have very early memories of being in my father's office and seeing a painting that just, like, was just burned into my retina. And that painting disappeared, and, and I've never been able to see it again. So I don't really know what it looks like, but there's always been this image in my head, and I've always been chasing it. And it's sort of like that's kind of, you know, it's a good metaphor for, for painting and abstraction, or not even just painting in general, art making. It's that you have this desire, and you're trying to capture it, and you're trying to go for it, and you're never going to get it. You're always going to be one sort of step behind. But it's so strong, so powerful that it like keeps you going. Um, so you know, again, it's like painting never turns out the way I imagine it's going to turn out initially. 
but it always turns out to be something, and I always end up learning something from it. Uh, I was looking at big letters from, from a sign graveyard outside of Las Vegas. Uh, another type of, you know, just thing, you know, sort of residue of our consumer culture. This is called Can Heat, 84 by 64 inches. Uh, 2007. That's a bus stop in Soviet era Russia. And that is a house, kind of, I guess, in the desert outside of uh, the Salton Sea. It's a shanty, I sort of like the combination of materials. Uh, Ellsworth Kelly. You know, again, I sort of was playing with these big forms and sort of abstracting them and painting them. Like, that's again, it's like, Ellsworth Kelly, it's like, he gets back to this thing I was about when I was a kid. It's like, I always see these things and I love them. And there's something so beautiful about them and sort of universal. At the same time, I just want to paint on them. <laughs> it's like, I want to paint on the wall. I just want to write, I don't know why, but I was like, I, if I could just have that and then paint on it, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> And which sort of gets to these kinds of paintings where you know there's these sort of monumental, almost minimalist forms, and then there's this kind of corruption or digression or uh, improvisation over them. Uh, just going back to slide, that's a wall in Berlin. That's a painting by uh, Raoul de Kaiser. They both kind of look like Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, this is called Woodshedding. This is in the show here from 2007. Uh, again, just using as many different types of painting processes as I can. Spray paint, you know, dripping, painting over, erasing, thick paint, thin paint. Uh, I just like this dialogue on the surface where all this stuff is happening. <coughs> this is called Trial Child. Uh, you know, you'll notice that like since 2007, most of my paintings are, are pretty large and they're vertically oriented. Uh, you know, again, this was sort of coming out of those drawings, but it was also, I wanted to sort of simplify things so that I could focus on just making the painting. Um, but I also like that the scale and the orientation is kind of a human scale. It's as if uh, you could walk into the painting, or you could have a dialogue with it as, you know, on that scale. This is called Empty Air. Uh, this is, I think, 120 inches tall by 96 wide. Uh, and this painting uses a lot of collage, it's like pieces of cardboard, paper, tape, spray paint, paint. This is in the show here. It's called Pressure Drop. Ed Ruscha, Christopher Wool, two artists who are using text in painting. Uh, you know, in the last uh, two years, uh, since I've been making these larger gestural paintings, I've also started to incorporate text into the paintings. Um, this is a barn with sort of proselytizing text, uh, you know, billboards, signage, all these things out there that are sort of in our, in our life that I just kind of am attracted to. This is called Upside Down Jesus, 2007. Uh, and then I was, you know, combing, you know, I'm always sort of combing the internet for images and I'll, I'll just put in, oops, uh, I'll put in, uh, I'll put in, uh, uh, you know, terms like like um, like uh, religious signage or um, you know outsider art uh, stuff like that. And I came across this guy, uh, uh, what's his name? C W. C W. Rice, W C Rice, and he has this thing down in Georgia. Prattville, Georgia, called Cross Garden, and basically he has this house that he painted over every surface, 
uh, scripture and all this stuff. And I came across this one that said, Sex Pit, Tell Me Jesus. And uh, at the same time, I had been wanting to get text into my work, and I couldn't really figure out how or like what text I would use. I didn't want it to be totally random, but I didn't want it to be forced. I didn't want to come up with something that just sort of seemed, you know, intellectual or arty or whatever. So this just stuck with me because I was literally, after I saw that image, I was walking around for a month just like sex people, <laughs> Jesus, just trying to figure out what the hell was me this guy was trying to get to. Uh, so I decided I'd have a show and I would call it Sex Pit. This would be the card. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, I was, <laughs> was going to name this show here Sex Pit, but uh, we thought there might be issues with that in terms of publishing uh, in the newspapers. So I called it Primal Scene, <laughs> which uh, for any of you psychology buffs. <laughs> You'll know that that's the primal scene is the moment when, as a child, you first walk in on your parents having sex. <laughs> uh, so this is the painting that I eventually made out of. This is the first text painting I made. Uh, this was uh, end of 2007. <coughs> you know, directly related to the bigger paintings, but now having text in it, and, and I like that. I like that the text is working. Uh, for me, it's successful when it works as mark making in the same, that it's structural, that it works as part of the composition of the painting, that it works as marks, but that it also uh, has meaning. It's a carrier of meaning and allows you to enter the painting in a different way. Uh, this is just a photograph I took along the road. Uh, Michel Madras, a, a painter who died in 2002 at the age of 35, but he uses a lot of text, and I like how he combines text and painting and, and sort of uh, this is called Self Help, um, another painting from the end of 2007, uh, except it says Self Help because it ran out of space and the TV fell off. But it was really good because I let you know, it's like, I don't know, at the same time I was going through just like a lot of personal problems and difficulties and I found myself reading a lot of self help books and I, it's just like I, I, felt, I felt pretty lame. <laughs> But uh, so, I don't know, so it, it just, but it had this, you know, this sort of thing of like, you know, trying to help yourself. It's like, it's, that's like, it's a, it's a bind, it's a hard place to be. You can't really, you know, you have to ask others for help. And so it's kind of this, the hell that you're in, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, this was the painting I made out of that larger, 60 by 60 years, 2008. This was the show I had. Uh, April 2008 at Mixed Greens in New York. More signage. These are uh, just some small drawings, this seven by five inch drawings, so now I'm using collage. These are from the last couple months. And this is a photo I took a few weeks ago on the street. More small drawings. This is Brian Eno playing. This is a large untitled painting from 2008. Uh, the color is kind of off in this, but it is kind of acidic yellow and sort of garish pink and blue. Sometimes paintings come directly from the little drawings. Sometimes they don't come at all from the little drawings. Sometimes there's crossover, sometimes there's not. This is untitled from uh, October 80, 80 by 64 inches. Uh, this is a painting I'm working on right now in my studio called LSD. You know, again, it's like the word, well, whatever. Did <laughs> you figure it out? Uh, that's James Booker, one of my favorite piano players. And a small drawing saying, authentic. Um, 
the small drawings, the text ones, I, I make small text drawings too. Usually they're very much about me talking to myself, uh, me encouraging myself, me telling me to keep going, just to keep doing what I'm doing because there's so many moments as an artist and, uh, you know, as, as anything um, where, you know, you just like, why do I, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why should I be bothered? Like, why do I keep doing this? And, uh, you know, it's like times like that where you just, uh, I don't know, you just, you just find a way to keep going. You tell yourself whatever you need to hear to make the next payment, you know. And uh, that's it. Thanks.